verse-by-verse -verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour back in our Father's Word, chapter 17. We're going to pick it up here in verse 22 in a moment. Remember, chapter 17 has to do with the Babylonian War. That is to say, uh, with Jerusalem having been in the fourth chapter, chapter 16, and God making an eternal covenant with that geographical location in the 60th verse of that prior chapter, chapter 16. But here he tells how that um, there would be war there. There would be trouble. Syria, Egypt, many other nations would come against her. But he would always have that remnant. And then as we pick it up in the 22nd verse, we find out what really is the salvation, not only of Jerusalem, but of the world. With that word of wisdom from our Father, let's pick it up if we may. Chapter 17, verse 22, and it reads, Thus saith the Lord God, I will also take of the highest branch of the high cedar and will set it. I will crop off from the top of his young twigs a tender one and will plant it upon a high mountain and imminent. That would be Mount Zion. And that high twig and that branch was the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the branch. And he is, as you read in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 2, that plant that would grow, that plant that would stem from Jesse down through um, David, that the Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten of Almighty God, so that whomever, those of Jerusalem and those of the world, all of God's children, that would believe could find salvation through that one branch, that branch that leads into the tree of life, uh, for Christ is the tree of life. Verse 23, In the mountain of the height of Israel will I plant it, and it shall bring forth boughs and, and bear fruit. Looking at Christians around the world today, that's the fruit thereof. And be a goodly cedar, and under it shall dwell all fowl of every wing, in the shadow of the branches thereof shall they dwell, whomsoever will. Whomsoever will love him, will trust him as Savior, that will come to him and partake of that salvation, they will find peace there. Verse 24, And all the trees of the field shall know that I, the Lord, have brought down the high tree, have exalted the low tree, have dried up the green tree, and have, had, and have made the dry tree to flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken and have done it. You might think, well, why, why the green tree and why would the dry tree flourish? Usually a dry tree means it's dead. Well, it means exactly that. We're talking flesh and spirit. When our Father transfigured the body of Jesus Christ, then that body was in the spirit, the dry. And that's when it really flourishes as it does even today. You know... You can remember when Christ was being, even at the time he was crucified, in Luke chapter 23, carrying that cross up to Golgotha to be nailed to it. What did he say when the women were weeping along the path as they went up to Golgotha uh, concerning the Lord Jesus Christ? What did he say? Uh, verse 28 of chapter 23, the great book of Luke. But Jesus turned unto them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children, that's offspring, umbilical cord to umbilical cord. For behold, the days are coming in the which they shall say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear and the paps that never gave suck. That is to say, blessed is going to be the day when those that are not pulled off by the false messiah. This, this has to do with uh, Mark 13 where he says, Woe to those that are with child and that give suck when I return. And it's speaking spiritually. It, you're supposed to wait for the true wedding, which is to say with Christ, 
not be wed and already have spiritual offspring with Satan, the false Christ, is not talking about a mother having a child in her womb. That's a blessing. Verse 30, it's better to be barren than to fall off into Satan's camp, all right? Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills cover us. When they realize they've been in the sack with Satan, that's the way a true Christian is going to feel. But if they haven't been taught that the false Christ comes first, that's their trip. Now, this is why we came here, verse 31. For if they do these things in a green tree, if they do this to me, the Savior, when I'm in the flesh with the blood circulating through these veins, what shall they do in the dry? What shall um, be done in the dry? How are they going to handle it then? Well, that's up to you. It's a personal decision. Everyone makes their, is responsible for their own lives. Your parents are not responsible for you, and you're not responsible for your parents. You sail your own Christian boat, and in the great book of life, right with our Father, is your name. It's everybody's name. And it doesn't say because of so-and-so, so-and-so did this. It says because you did it. Everyone must take responsibility for themselves. And many might say, well, how would I know? Well, well, God sent you a letter. Have you read it? Have, have you read the instructions that he gives you on how to find that salvation, how to behave yourself, how to interact with uh, people of the world, especially your own people? Then um, you're without excuse. Our Father has written that letter and the Holy Spirit there to back you up, and, and um, you need to sail your own boat. We're going to go into the 18th chapter. And, and it, it is a beautiful chapter about personal responsibility. Let's just get right into it. Chapter 18, verse 1. The word of the Lord came unto me again, saying, 2. What mean ye that ye use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, the fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. Well, what is this proverb you've got that the children suffer for the sins of the father? That just doesn't happen. And as a matter of fact, if you go to Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 29, it states very clearly, never again can it be said that a child's teeth are set on edge because a father eats a sour grape. And we're all responsible for our own acts. And, and one of the biggest mistakes people make is, is the old blame game. Well, if so-and-so hadn't have done no, no, you made the decision. When it came down to the last lap, you made the decision to do what you do. And you are the one that answers for it. Verse 3, As I live, saith the Lord God, you shall not have occasion any more to use this proverb in Israel. You're going to answer for yourself, is what he's saying. Verse 4, Behold, all souls are mine. And don't you ever forget that. All souls are mine as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And, you know, you'll have these people that I'm going to get around to giving my soul to God. It's too late, Charlie. He owns you. You can't give your soul to God. He created it. It belongs to him. He's got it to do with as he chooses. And the, the beauty of it is, he says right there, the soul that sins, that will not straighten itself out, going to die. Now, when a soul dies, that's a pretty final thing. When a flesh body dies, the soul goes instantly back to the Father that gave it, and there's an opportunity for eternal life. But when a soul dies, it's over. That's, that's the end, uh, and, and uh, so it is. So, but when, when you hear these people that would tell you, well, you need to give your soul to God, they're, they, they're not students of God's Word. Because if they were, they wouldn't be familiar with this particular verse this fourth verse of the 18th chapter of Ezekiel, all souls are mine. That's what our Father states, and I'm going to tell you something. That's exactly the way it is. 
Verse 5, But if a man be just, and do that which is lawful and right, and the word man here is not Adam, it's Ish in the Hebrew tongue, which means any people. That would be Gentile, whoever, if any man does what is right. Six, and hath not eaten upon the mountains, neither hath the, eaten upon the mountains means uh, uh, grove worship, that sort of thing. Neither hath lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, neither hath defiled his neighbor's wife, neither hath come near to a minstress woman, verse 7, and hath not oppressed any, but hath restored to the debtor his pledge, hath spoiled none by violence, hath given his bread to the hungry, and hath covered the naked with a garment. What, what is the bread you're supposed to give? The bread of life. That's to say Christ himself, the Word. And what is this clothing that you don't leave them naked? The gospel armor. You, you give them something to really protect themselves, and that's to say to be in the service. So what we're talking about here is a very good man. We're talking here about a man that is serving God in every way that best he can, and I'm sure God's going to be very happy with it. Verse 8, He that hath not given forth unto, upon usury, doesn't charge his brother usury, neither hath taken any increase, didn't rip him off, that hath withdrawn his hand from iniquity, has pulled away from sin, hath executed true judgment between man and man. In other words, fair is fair, and just is just, and he's probably pretty well lived that way. And, and uh, so what we're talking about here is a child of God that does his best, uh, basically, to please God, to follow God's word. So what, what happens? Verse 9, hath walked in my statutes and, and hath kept my judgments to deal truly he is just, meaning he's been justified. He shall surely live, saith the Lord God. You see, our Father is always fair. Now, we're, we're going to take three different people in this, three different generations, a father, a son, and a grandson. And, but it has no bearing, kinship has no bearing whatsoever as far as justification is concerned or as far as judgment is concerned. The point is, all souls belong to God, and there are all his children, and he's going to judge each one of them by his own merits, not somebody else's. So if you're one of these that like to point fingers and have all things that happen bad and everything um, to you personally, then you can stop. Start making better decisions and start trying to do what is right and be blessed of God and, and have that completeness. Verse 10, this just man that's going to live, verse 10, if he begat a son that is a robber, a shedder of blood, he's a murderer, and that doeth the like to any one of these things, I mean, goes contrary to God's word, Verse 11, and that does not any of those duties, but even have eaten upon the mountains. He's up there grove worshiping and rolling eggs in the spring. That's, that's where it comes from, from Ishtar's uh, great, that heathen goddess and her fertility routes, uh, riots in the woods, the forest, forest worship. And defiling and defiled his neighbor's wife, verse 12, hath oppressed the poor and needy, I mean, rips off everybody, hath spoiled by violence, hath not restored the pledge, never keeps his word. I mean, you don't ever shake hands with him because he's not going to keep his word. And hath lifted up his eyes to the idols, never worships our Heavenly Father, but he likes traditions of men, and he, he likes um, 
the, the ways of men that make void the word of God, hath committed abomination. Abomination is that he would rather go the way of Satan than he would of our Heavenly Father. Now, here you've got two different men, one the son of the other. How is God going to judge this? That's what he's showing you. Verse 13, hath given forth upon usury, rips his brother off right and left, and hath taken increase. Shall he then live? Question. I mean, God wants to be fair. Should I let one like this live? Well, if God is fair, we know he can't. It would be impossible. So let's see what he does. Sh shall he then live? He shall not live. He hath done all these abominations. He shall surely die. His blood shall be upon him. Not on somebody else. No need to point fingers. He did it. It's all his fault. It's his responsibility to be responsible for himself. Now, that is fair and just. This is how the law should be even today rather than by precedent. When you go to court today, it's not going to be by this law. It's going to be by precedent that happened at a court or a trial of people probably you never heard of them before. You don't even know them. But as they were judged by man, not God, that's how you're going to be judged, judged by precedent. And maybe you'll get a fair break, and maybe you won't, because we do not have a perfect law. Because instead of common law, we have law by precedent. That's just like if you were to follow somebody that um, would listen to this big preacher five minutes and then another big preacher over here five minutes and never go to the Word of God. You'd be in a heap of hurt because you're studying man and not the Word of God chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And, and so it is with the law and so it is with the Word of God. You are responsible for your own self. Now get this straight in your mind. Your soul belongs to God. Well, why did God create the souls? For his pleasure. Last verse, chapter 4, great book of Revelation. He does not want to destroy someone that he created for his pleasure. And, and um, I could even put this on a different level. You, you are his property. He does not enjoy destroying his own property. And there's a great deal more love involved within this because God loves his children. And it hurts him when it comes to having to destroy one. But because he loves all the others, if there's one absolutely no good, then he will take care of business. But this man brought it upon himself. He can't blame God. He can't blame his father. He can't blame anyone else. It's his own fault. You are always the captain of your ship in life. And your decision is always your own decision. You know, you can counsel someone, you can talk to someone, and you can yak, yak, yak here and yak, yak there, but when it comes right down to it, that person's going to do what they want to do. That's their own decision. And they will answer for it. Whether it's just or unjust, so it is. Why? Because God is the judge. And he's laying it out for you here exactly how he judges men, those that are blessed and those that are not. Where do you fit in that way of life? I don't know. You know I don't. So now let's go with another. That we've got a good man and we've got a bad one. The good man's going to live. The bad one's going to die spiritually. Verse 14 to continue. Now, lo... If he begat a son, here goes the third generation, that seeth all his father's sins which he hath done, and considereth and doeth no not such like. No, he looks at what a louse his father is. Man, I don't want to go there. I don't want to get involved in that. I can tell by looking at him. I, I, I want a better life. 
verse 15, that hath not eaten upon the mountains, he didn't take part in those sexual rituals, heathenistic practices, neither hath lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, worshiped someone other than God, hath not defiled his neighbor's wife, verse 16, neither hath oppressed any, hath not withholden the pledge, he always keeps his word, neither has spoiled by violence, he's a peaceful sort, but hath given his bread to the hungry, he has shared every bit of the gospel that he receives himself when he is asked a question for strength and, and, um, and, and stamina by somebody that is down and needs a little encouragement, and hath covered the naked with the garment and placed upon them the gospel armor to, fire, to stand against the fiery darts of Satan. Okay? We've got a good, good guy here. Now, if, in as much as you already know how God's going to judge him, because God is fair, and fair is fair, and what is right is right. I think most people can understand what is right, and you should live that way, if you want God's blessings. If you don't want God's blessings, hey, have a good trip. You better enjoy it while you can. It's not going to last long. Seventeen that hath taken off his hand from the poor, never, never takes advantage, that hath not received usury nor increase, doesn't rip his brother off, hath executed my judgments, hath walked in my statutes, he follows my law, he shall not die for the iniquity of his father, he shall surely live. And so it is. Our Father is always fair, and our Father owns all souls. I mean, that's why you don't want to judge people, because that's what gives God the right to judge. He owns them. They're His. They belong to Him. They are His children. And He will always be equitable. He will always be fair. You can count on that. If some preacher comes along and says, well, he's out to zap somebody today, that's a lie. God loves his children. And he's not, he's not out looking for someone to zap. He's out looking for someone to hug, to love, and to have that love returned. Someone that he can say, that's my child. Just like he told uh, Satan concerning Job. He said, what do you think about my boy Job down there? He's a good one. Do your father glad and proud and happy by doing what is right always. Now, let's, let's take this to another level, verse 18 to continue. As for his father, because he cruelly oppressed, I mean, he was bad, spoiled his brother by violence, and did that which is not good among his people, Lo, even he shall die in his iniquity. You can count on it. 19, let's go to a different level. Yet say ye, why? Question. Doth not the Son bear the iniquity of the Father, when the Son hath done that which is lawful and right, and hath kept all my statutes and hath done them? He shall surely live. One's not going to be responsible for the other, and don't ever let anyone take you down that path. You are responsible for your own actions, period. 20. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. That makes it pretty plain and very simple, whereby that God is fair. And you know something? Because he is the ultimate judge, you know you're going to get a good break. When, when you try to do what's right, you're going to be treated fairly. Again, as I stated earlier, not by the law of precedent, but by God's law, which is simply common sense and the bare facts, verse 21. But, let's go to a different level. 
But if the wicked turn from all his sins that he hath committed and keep all my statutes and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. That's why that branch was sprouted from the last chapter verse in verse 22, 1722. It's called the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he paid that price on the cross. But if someone repents and goes to the Father, though he was bound to die, yet shall he live. Why? Because our Father is fair. All souls are his. Well, I, I mean, he did so much wrong, I would just like to see him die. No, you wouldn't. He's your brother. He, he's a fellow citizen of Almighty God, as all people are. And if he can change and if he repents, then welcome him home. Verse 22. Listen carefully. All his transgressions, all that stuff he did that was bad, we listed it one by one, that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. In other words, in the book of life, where all the records are kept, when he repents, all the bad stuff is erased. Don't mention it to God. Don't even talk about it. God doesn't want to hear about it. God forgave it. It doesn't exist anymore. So don't bring it up. Our Father is so loving and so fair. How can you not serve him? knowing you're going to get a fair break regardless of what. Man doesn't have anything to do with it. You're responsible. It's just between you and him, our Father. And you're always going to get a fair break there. He's always, if you want his blessings, then do what is right and be blessed. Be fruitful because God will see that you uh, are fruitful in, in doing God's work and bringing many children to Almighty God through the example that you set forth. Verse 23, listen, you want to know how some of, how God feels? Listen to it carefully. Verse 23, have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die? I want you to hear your father say that. Do you think I have any pleasure at all if I have to sentence one of my own children to death? saith the Lord, and not that he should return from his ways and live. Never forget chapter, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. What does it say? It's the emotions of God. It states, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to get it as near accurate as I can, God is long-suffering, and he's got lots of patience with his children. He is long-suffering, and it is his wish or hope that all come to repentance. They won't. But that's what he wants them to do. Why? Because when they repent, he washes them clean and gives them a fresh start in life. Why? Because he loves them. Well, I thought God hated everybody. No, he loves his children. That's why he created them. What, do you think he created something that he would, just for the fact of hating it, as fair as he is, why would he do a thing like that? He would not. It is the person, each entity having free will, that decides to do with their life as they so choose, that God is going to judge fairly and equitably. You're going to get everything you've got coming to you, bam, just like that. It's a good idea to have all the bad erased. You do that by repenting, and that pleases our Father. You know, this is the reason he gave us the parable of the prodigal son. The prodigal son takes his liquidity, not his inheritance, his liquidity. That's his, his money in the bank. And he, he goes into town, and, man, he's got friends as long as that money lasts. You know, you can buy them. You can buy friends. They won't stay with you, though, because the money was gone, the friends were gone. 
and he was out in a pig pen eating slop with the pigs. And all of a sudden he woke up. My father feeds his servants better than this. My father treats those that work for him a lot better than this. I'm going to go home and see if I just can't work for my father. And off he goes back home, and his father met him, killed a fatted calf, and l hugged him, loved him, had a feast for him, because he came home repentant. And that's what God wants from you, is, is that repentance of, of falling away from any type of sin as best you can. No, we're, we're in the flesh, and no one is perfect. But... The thing I want you to grasp is the love of your father and his patience and the fact that he is so forgiving. He says, don't bring it up anymore. I don't, want, I don't remember it. I don't want it mentioned. I don't want to talk about it. You're a free soul. I've written your bill here clean. Why? Because he loves you. Don't you ever let someone tell you that God is a God of hate. He's a God of love. He only hates that that would cause much trouble for those that are innocent. God so protects the innocent. So, because people have free will, and that's the only way God can receive love from an entity is to give it free will without ordering it, without demanding it, without trying to buy it. That kind of love is fake. But love must always generate within each heart and soul and go out to the Father. It's a good lesson. You want to think about that. Don't miss the next lecture. Bless your heart. You listen a moment. Won't you please?